We're going to talk about rejoicing. Can you put the title up real quick? <laughs> Singing in the furnace. Thank you. I was totally going to botch that. I, uh, singing in the, when I think of the word rejoice, the word that comes to mind is singing. Uh, we, uh, we live out uh, kind of off the road with all this rain. We hear the frogs singing at night. You know why they call it croaking? It sounds like they're dying when they're singing. But when I think of singing, I don't think of frogs. I think of birds. You go out and you sit out in the, uh, just the middle of nowhere and just listen to the birds. And everything seems to just be peaceful. Uh, and I love to listen to the singing of birds. You know what else? You ever, it doesn't happen that much anymore. And I want to encourage you, just try this. It's kind of weird because it doesn't happen much anymore. Go out in the mall or Walmart and just whistle. Whistle as you shop, okay? Maybe someone will look at you like you're weird. Actually, if you've got the guts, sing while you shop. Uh, it's contagious. I promise you, people love to hear people sing. Why is that? There's just something about singing that lifts the Most people singing that lifts the heart. Some people <laughs> sing like frogs, and you should better off just whistle. Uh, so singing in the furnace, this whole idea of the furnace being the, the trials of life. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I wonder if they sang while walking through the furnace, if they whistled. You know, what did they do? What, what took place? Uh, but how cool would it be if we can get to a point today or at some point in our journey and our faith that we can sing in the furnace? I want to ask you this question. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter says in verse 6, he says, In this you rejoice, even though you may be grieved, if necessary, by various trials. Okay? Paul says... In Romans, Paul says in Philippians 4, I think verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, Ecclesiastes, I'm gonna I want to push you all to think for a minute. I know. Some of you really was hoping just to watch a stupid video or something. That's coming. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 4. Anybody know it? There is a time for weeping. A time for laughing, a time for mourning, a time for dancing. Romans 12, 15. If you're listening, one year, six months ago, you would know what it said. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. We have two messages that are, that are in the Bible. Peter and Paul say rejoice at all times. Boil it down. Rejoice at all times. Paul and Solomon say, hey, there's a time for weeping and mourning. Fill in the blanks with rejoicing. Do those passages stand in contradiction to each other? Don't try to get fancy and be like a pastor and try to figure out, like, how does rejoicing happen in the heart and we weep on the surface and how we can do the... You can't do both of them at the same time. I tried. It's not possible. I cannot rejoice and weep at the same time, which means I cannot rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, and this may be rubbing some of you wrong right now, because Paul says, God says, rejoice in the Lord always. But what about those times of weeping? Can you rejoice and weep at the same time? I'm going with no. It just seems simple to me. It's not possible to be crying and laughing, unless you're laughing. It's just not possible. Is it? Okay, what is the answer? All right, don't, don't say it out loud. I think I've got the right one. And if yours contradicts mine, I'm just moving on. What is the answer? Take what you know about human nature. Take what you know about God. Take what you know about the fall. Take what you know about eternity in heaven. What is the answer? Let's start here. Weeping and mourning is not a... Uh, is not a transgression against God's law. Start there. Second, weeping and mourning, just like rejoicing, begins in the heart. Weeping and mourning was introduced into the world when fall and sin happened. When separation from God took place, weeping and mourning was ushered into the world. There will be a day 
Revelation 21.4, do you have that, Nancy? There will be a day. There will be no more weeping or mourning. It says, verse 4 says, uh, Revelation 21, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. There will be a day where weeping and mourning will not take place in the presence of God. So what's the answer? Here's what I think it is. That Paul and Peter are pointing us to a direction, to a place we will be for all of eternity for those who are found in the Lord. That there will be a day you will rejoice and sing forever and ever because you live and dwell in the presence of God. But today, right here, right now, they are showing us a picture of what we can enter into. That today we can enter into it in the eternal bliss of forever joy and excitement that resides in our hearts because we have a relationship with God. But when those tragic moments happen in our life or someone else's life and weeping and mourning takes place, that we are seeing a direct picture of the result of sin in this world. And we enter into the lives of those who are affected by the fall, of those who who have been affected because they have been separated by God, be it one of us, be it someone outside of the church, outside the family of God, that we have the opportunity to mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep. But at the same time, we can, we can hold on to an attitude and a heart of rejoicing. And Peter shows us how. And we'll get there. We'll get there. So, when we say rejoice in the Lord always or rejoice or singing in the furnace, we are not overlooking the fact that mourning and weeping is a natural result of the fall and our beautiful opportunities to enter into people's lives and reflect the love of God in their lives and help bridge that separation, that gap between them and God. I just want to start there. I want to give you a roadmap to where we're going today. Uh, we're going to talk about trials just real briefly. It's going to seem pretty quick. We're going to jump into some practical things. One thing for us as a church family, one thing that I, I as your pastor, want us to embrace, I want to talk about one practical thing that you can do as an individual that's walking alongside someone that is suffering, uh, going through trials, and then I want to talk to you if you are walking through them yourself. Uh, so let's just start at, let's just start with what is what are the trials what are the trials Peter is talking about verse 6 of uh, chapter 1 first Peter In this you rejoice. We're going to talk about what the in this is uh, towards the end. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials. All right, just the contextual trials that Peter is probably addressing are are the trials of being persecuted because you are a believer in God. I, I do not believe that that gets rid of all other trials in life. Let's just be real. You may be persecuted as a Christian where you're at today, but it's probably not like what Peter's time was going through. Nero uh, and the way he would persecute Christians, Peter is writing to Gentiles in modern-day Turkey, uh, and uh, they were being persecuted as Christians. That's what the trials that Peter's probably hinting on to. But it leaves it open. This word trial uh, can have two meanings in the New Testament. It could, it, could be, it could mean to be tested with something good to reveal your faith. So like you're given a lump sum of money that could be a blessing from God, but could also uh, reveal where you're at with, in your faith. Or... Or a trial can be, and one, one commentator I read put it this way, an experiment of evil. Okay, just the fact that Peter says you're grieved by trials tells me it's the second and not the first. Uh, if you've been grieved because you won the jackpot, just uh, I'll help you out, and uh, you can fork, fork the money over to me, and I'll take on that burden. Uh, it's not what he's talking about. These trials are very heavy burdens in these people's lives. Literally, experiments of evil. Have you ever felt like you've been an experiment of evil, of like Satan, or hit one of his minions, or someone else? 
And you know how hard that is when life just crumbles in around you, like everything you touch is, goes wrong? You see, for some, for some of us, uh, this is the category I put myself in, it doesn't take much to feel like you're an experiment of evil. It just takes one little thing, and then your mind, your fallen nature just takes that out of proportion, and it, it just and it runs with it. So let's just say, um, oh, for example, uh, I was running my concrete saw in my house, and I had a massive ringing in my ears for a couple days, and I thought I lost my hearing. And I could not hear my cell phone. So I went out and bought a new cell phone. The next cell, the new, my new cell phone, I couldn't hear on it. And I'm telling my brother, I'm like, I'm deaf. I can hear everybody except in my phone. I go to the doctor, and like, it just becomes this huge issue in my head. I go to the cell phone store, I'm like, I guess I can return my phone. I can't hear on it. And the guy looks at it, he's like, oh, you got a piece of plastic over the earpiece. Here you go. I was like, wow. That's it? Something small became a trial to me. You see, it's sometimes it's just it's something very minute. But for others, it's something really tragic and really huge. Regardless, here's what, we don't, here's what I don't want us to do is to look at that trial and say, ah, you shouldn't be stressed out like that. You shouldn't be going through that. Like, you shouldn't be experiencing it. That's small. We all have our worldviews based upon our experiences and whatnot. And God is working in all of us in, in, in different ways. So we all are grieved by trials. We are all at times feel like or have been an experiment of evil. Nero would be a classic example of that. During Peter's time, how long can I burn a Christian for on a, on a stick to see how long he can light up a street? Nero literally experimented on Christians. Here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to turn here, and, and I want to talk to us as a church. I want to give us a practical way how we can walk with people going through trials. We're going to, we're going to jump into revelations in about 10, 15 minutes. But we're just going to talk practical for a minute. Uh, how can we reflect the love of God to those going through trials? One very practical way is this. A Sunday morning, and I've, I've had conversations with the leaders multiple times. Um, this used to be me. Okay, this used to be me. And at times I have slip ups and it still is. See if you can pick out how this doesn't help. Let's say you haven't been to church in four weeks. Whatever reason, got kids and they just, just can't get them going. You've been sick. Or maybe you can only make it every four weeks. Whatever reason. Already you're walking in that door. You're already feeling a little disconnected, disoriented, and uh, maybe a little bit. Not, not at home. I see you come through that door, and my first words is, hey, welcome, stranger. Or, or hey, haven't seen you in a while. Or, I've been saving you a seat. Or, where have you been? Here, here's where I'm going. You may, may think this is a little disconnected. It's not. We do not know what's going on in that person's life. You want the best for them. You absolutely do. But, but quick say, uh, statements like that puts them in a spot that either has to address where they've been, reveal to you what's going on in their lives and their hearts, laugh like it was funny and it really wasn't, and uh, just and rather what I would want is that person to walk in and feel accepted, regardless the number of times they've been here before. So to me, statements I want to say when that person walks in is, hey, I'm so glad you're here. Hey, welcome back to Midtown. Yeah, let's take that one out. Welcome. You know, hey, can I help you with your kids? Uh, can I get you a cup of coffee? A donut? Eat the donut on the way. Let me go get you another one. You know, just really small statements that reflect the love of Christ and takes the spotlight off that person and just keeps it on you. You know, just a very practical way. We don't know what trial, if any, they're walking through. I just want to assume that they've had a rough time for those four weeks. I want to do everything I can make them feel at home here. Church, just one way, one way, one simple way on a Sunday morning, we can enter into each other's life. Oh, one thing you say is, how are you doing? How have you been doing? Another simple way to enter in. Uh, also, what I want to do is just now, what about you walking alongside someone that you know is going through a hard time? Let's say it's something just ridiculous, 
that you don't see as a hard time, but it is to them, or it's something just outright. It doesn't matter. They're stressing. They're anxious. They're depressed. And you're going, uh, and, uh, and you're walking alongside of them. Once again, we have cliches that we toss out that do not reflect the love of Jesus. You know, cliches like, get over it. That's life. You've been dealt a bad hand. Are all disconnected cliches that are not weeping with those who weep, that are not mourning with those who mourn. Uh, one that was told me this week, which I've never heard before, but I guess he, uh, he's heard it, is what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Right? What, I mean, what is that implying? Like, whatever is in your heart, you know, let's just say you're stressed out and you are angry and you just, you're frustrated and you just can't control it. It's implying that you are evil and angry and can't control it in your hearts and really that you don't know the Lord. One that I've heard, I'm not running to someone that's, that's heard this before, but uh, so maybe I made it up and said it myself. Either way, it's this, is that you know what you are when you're squeezed. Squeeze an orange, orange juice should come out. You squeeze a Christian, and what's implied, and there's usually silence after that when I say it to myself, Greg, when you squeeze a Christian uh, yourself, Christ should come out. And then I found out, you squeeze me, sometimes I cuss. You squeeze me, sometimes I get mad and angry and yell. Here's the, here's the, here's the point. Jesus Christ is always dumping out the murky water in the bucket that's dipping out of the well of my heart and replacing it with fresh water, living water. You squeeze me, and apple juice might come out of the orange, and Jesus says, that's quite all right. Let's clean that up. It's all right. Day after day, I'm refining him. But we say cliches like, get over it. Or like, uh, that's not how the Christian should act. And we just take out of context the storm, the furnace, that the person is walking in. How about, hey, can I, can I hug you? Can, I, I hesitate to say this one. Can I pray with you? You just uh, had us 30 minutes later, are we still praying here? You know, you make the trial just all that much worse. Uh, but maybe like a quick prayer. Hey, can I just, can I pray with you? Uh, can, can you just tell me about it? You see, just reflections of God's love onto that person all in the hopes to get them to rejoice in the midst of their trial. But if they don't get there, that's okay. If you don't get there, that's okay. What about you? Okay, let's just talk about you. Let's just say nobody in your life is able to help you get to that point where even in this, you can rejoice, even though you're grieved by various trials. What can you do? What can you do? Uh, and like I said before, sometimes these trials are just minute. But in your mind, you've gone worst-case worst case scenario. Just something small has happened, and you just can't control your thoughts. And worst-case scenario is popping up. Uh, Zach, let me, get you, let me get you up here real quick. See, we're like... We're like a balloon. Uh, as you put air into the balloon, the balloon begins to expand. <sighs> and just keep going, buddy. <laughs> and, you know, and each, each puff of air is like another trial or another thought that is out of control that's leading to pressure and build up in our lives. And as the balloon gets... You blew that up quick. <laughs> as the balloon gets bigger, it becomes more transparent. And you can begin to see through it. The color begins to fade, and you're like, it's going to blow. And you probably got people in your life, or maybe yourself, you're like, I'm going to blow. I can't take anymore. All right. Because I'm going to scream like a way I don't want to scream in public, like that. So, yeah, because it'll scare me. Uh, well, when you're sick, you're just on edge, you know, and like everything just becomes, ha, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And we're a lot like that balloon when we're under pressure, regardless what that first puff was that sent us in that direction. You know, I got, I got a video here based on a true story that I want to show you that uh, maybe you can relate to, that sometimes it's just something small that begins, that begins the trial and begins to uh, just spiral your world out of control. Thanks. Baby, when I look at you, 
Bet you I just snapped my serpentine belt. Second. No, oh, it's the front end. It is definitely the front end. Oh, I'm getting married. I can just imagine the bill it's gonna be to fix it. Oh, I think you think that I hope it does not explode. Man, is this thing gonna break down? front end and it just collapse. I mean, I, I've never heard a noise like that in my life, and I know this, it's going to explode. I, I know it's going to explode. I'm not, I'm not even going to make it home. This thing is going to blow up, and I'm going to die. Midtown Church. I don't remember seeing this church here before. new job, getting married, and um, and today, just driving down the road, and the truck makes this awful loud noise, and what kind of noise? It, I mean, it was, it's hard to explain, it's like a creak or squeak, maybe, um, but it sounded like this, like, What's going on in your mind? Well, first thing I think, I'm a worst case scenario type guy. The truck explodes. It's a year of squeak and you're thinking your truck's gonna explode. P pretty logical thinking. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I drive that thing a lot, it's old. Might be logical thinking for you, but it's not necessarily healthy or normal. You know, let me show you something here. <clears throat> you see how like the hair's coming out of it and stuff? That sucker grew up overnight about a year ago. Okay. It's gross. Yeah, I know. Uh, and when I saw that, I thought that my first thought was like, oh great, a new mole. I, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. My next thought was, I have stage five melanoma cancer and I'm gonna die probably within the hour. And uh, you know, it's just kind of human nature that we take simple little various trials and before long, they just blow up to these unrealistic sufferings and we put ourselves through this stress. One thing we can do is take those thoughts captive. You know, as soon as I saw my mole and I started thinking cancer, if I take that thought captive and I remove it and I replace it with like rejoicing or giving thanks, uh, then it keeps me from going through that stress or anxiety that I'm not really designed to go through. I mean, that may be easy for you to do. You're a pastor. Well, yeah. But I to know. take that thought captive, as you say, I mean, how do you go from a truck exploding, which means you're dead, and no wedding, no nothing, you're dead. How do you go from there to thinking good things? 
That's a great question. It really happened, by the way. You can laugh. Uh, we had that long conversation in our driveway. My truck's squeaking. I think I'm going to end up catapulting down the interstate and be dead. Uh, how do you go from a squeaky truck to a I'm going to die because of my squeak to uh, singing in the fire, in the furnace? How do you go from this to uh, someone that's not under pressure? Even when the trials of life uh, begin to stir up. The answer is let out some air. All right, just let out some air. How do you do that? Yeah, that seems, seems reasonable. Give it to God. Be it, be it something small, like a squeak in the truck, or something like my daughter just got diagnosed with cancer, or my boss just pulled me into his office. Those first thoughts are either going to control you or you're going to give them to God and God's going to crush them. Give them to God. But sometimes life just gets the better of you and before long you're under so much pressure you just don't know what to do. Cry out to God and just... Kind of sounds like your squeak. Uh, and just hand it over to God. Well, Greg, what does that mean? Well, take every thought captive. What does that mean? Take every thought captive. Well, uh, that, Greg, it doesn't make sense. Look, Greg, maybe you've never been there. Peter, maybe you've never been there. You're telling me to rejoice in my trials. Paul, you're saying rejoice in the Lord. Oh, have you not been there? What does that mean? Every thought. Every thought. God, God, this may sound ridiculous. I think I'm going to die because of the squeak in my truck. God, this may sound ridiculous, but I am so fearful because of this mole that popped up overnight. God, this may sound ridiculous, but my finances are in shackles, even though I make six digits. God, this may sound ridiculous. I don't know what to do with my fear. I don't know what to do with my worry. I don't know what to do with my anxiety, my depression, my sadness. I don't know what to do. Let the air out. Who? To who? You can vent to one of us. Most definitely, God is the only one who can begin to alter and change your course of life through your faith in Him. But here is, here, here's the crux of the problem. The more we try to control, the more we want to control. Because we, we can become so fearful at times. right? That little ounce of control that you have in your squeaky life, in your, in your trial, that brings a little... Satan is so clever. He allows you just a little measure of peace to, te to tempt you to hold on to that control. A little bit of, of it's going to be okay because look what I did. But God has a, a well that is full of living water that when it's in here, our rejoicing can be even in the furnace. We've got to give it to God. And there's no, there's no equation to that. There's no, here's the words to say. It's you and God. And lay it on them. 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 But it cannot stop there. There has to be another part to it. You see, like this balloon, I've got to... See how it's stretched out? It's so much easier to fill it up with air now. This is, the, this is the, uh, uh, a new one. It takes a lot more effort to put air back into it. You see, the moment you give it to God, the moment you release that air, that vent, the venting, whatever it is to God, it wants to come right back. Right back. It's, and it's ready, and it's primed, and it's stretched out, and you want your heart just like, let me take it back, let me take it back. Philippians 4, just continue. Cast your cares upon God. Put something else in that balloon. Put something else in your heart. And Peter, this is where Peter does not leave us hanging. Absolutely amazing. He's, he says this in verse 6. In this you rejoice. There it is. What in what? What is it that we replace those stressful, negative, weighing us down, no good for nothing thoughts 
with. Easy. Think of heaven. Think of heaven. That's what he says. Look at this, verse 5. Back up one verse. Verse 4, to an inheritance. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. It will never change. This world will change day after day, but one thing is always constant. Heaven is waiting for those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As verse 5 says, it is being guarded by God's power through your faith. Undefiled, imperishable, and unfading. It is there regardless of your circumstances. You can always go to what is ahead. Who by God's power, verse 5, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Greg, what do I do? I, right now in your life, whatever there may be going on, it's just the anxiety is just building a little. The stress is building a little. The, 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 the volume of my voice is causing it to build. Thank heaven. Thank heaven. What is heaven? What is, what is heaven? What do I think of? Do I think of gold? Do I think of God? What, what, what do I think of? We've done this a few times, and we're going to do it again. Revelations 21 and part of 22. I'm going to read it all to you. You get a beautiful picture of what is in store for those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something. If we had the money as a church, I would give to every new believer and every one of you who know the Lord a plaque with these words and a description of what lies ahead. Paul says the same thing in Romans 12, I don't, or maybe Romans 10. I, I, I don't even consider the sufferings of today because they're not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in me. I'm not, we, we're not trying to answer those trials, and get rid of them, that's, that's God's. That's God's role, and that's your tendency. It's going to be answer, just answer, fix, fix, fix. That's God's. That's not what we want to do. We want to figure out how do we sing in the furnace. It's so contagious. Singing is so contagious. I absolutely love it. Try it. I just try. You never know, walking through Walmart, when you start singing or whistling, somebody... That listens up. Paul and Silas in prison singing, and the guard listened up. If I got my stories right, by the end of the day, by the end of the night, him and his family were being baptized. Singing in the furnace. The key, think of heaven. Think of heaven. It sounds simplistic, it sounds elementary. Well, let's keep it that way. If it's easy and simple, let's keep it easy and simple. Today, you go home, something wells up. Stop that thought. Captivate that thought by giving it to God and saying, no, you know, you know maybe in 10 years, maybe in 10 minutes, maybe in 30 years, I'm going to be in the presence of God forever. And I can start that right now. I can rejoice in that right now. Let's go to Revelation 21. If you want to pull your Bibles out, if you want to sit and listen, I'm going to ask you to uh, go ahead and pull down the house lights. Uh, keep the uh, stage lights where they're at. I'm going to read all of 21. There will be parts of it that don't necessarily reflect what heaven is like, but it's, it's all conclusive. It's the best picture we have of, of what we have to look forward to. This, what I'm about to read to you, is unfading, it's undefiled and it's never going to perish. This is for real. Heaven is for real. This is not something that we're like hoping pans out in the end. This is not something that we can logically, with knowledge and reason, figure out. All we, we walk by faith and what we're about to read is absolutely the case because God said it is. If you're going through those trials right now, maybe what you need to do right now is just close your eyes and, and soak in the words. If you, if you are found in the Lord, meaning you have faith in Jesus Christ, that's between you and Jesus, you and God. I'm not here to judge it by your actions, what you say, what you do. 
These words are meant for you. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. I want to personalize this. I want to make this as personal to you as I can. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with me. He will dwell with me, and I will be his. And God himself will be with me as my God. He will wipe away every tear from my eye, and death will be no more. Neither will, be, neither will there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels, who had the seven bulls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as a crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. Verse 14, And on the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Don't lose me here. Just stay in these words. Stay in the words, even the dry ones that are not descriptive. Just lock in to these images. Verse 15, and the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. This is so specific. How incredible that we can begin forming this city in our mind. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadium. Its length and its width and height are equal. He also measured its wall. 144 cubits by human measurements, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth Chrysoprase, the eleventh Jason, the twelfth Amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And verse 22 goes on and says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb, and the city has no, re no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God give its light and its lamp is the Lamb. Verse 24, By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gate will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter into it. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And it keeps going. Chapter 22 then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river. 
the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face. They will see his face. You will one day see Jesus' face. You will see Jesus and know that your faith was not in vain. That all the ridicule and blasphemy and everything that you took and this side of the grave was not in vain. You will see Jesus' faith. Face, how incredible. His name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And verse 7, and behold, I am coming soon. Those are words you can bet your life on. Those are words you can lock into. And those are words you can give everything for. Not to be insensitive, but your trials don't even begin to measure up with the glory that will be revealed in the children of God. Stress and anxiety and depression has no place in the life of God's children. What I'd like to do, if you don't mind and if you're able, would you stand with me? church I want us to uh, I want us to join each other we're going to sing the song came to my rescue we just read Jesus is coming back he is coming to rescue his children from this world to fully adopt them but today right now right now don't want to overlook the right now the sufferings the trials that you're going through it doesn't matter guys if it's a squeaky truck or if it's death that lies right around the corner if it's me if it's big to you it's big to me and big to us as your church what i want to do is give you an opportunity to allow your church to pray for you just if you're bold enough if you are going through the furnace, regardless of what that furnace looks like to you, would you slip your hand up in here and just hold it there for a minute? Would you take a look around if there's a hand up? If there's a hand up, would you place, a, would you place your hand on that shoulder? Maybe you need to get out of your seat and go across the room or something. I want this church to connect right now. We have, we have family members who are going through hard times and they are having the hardest time locking into these words of glory and we can help be their family and walk with them it's that is just life but how incredible is everlasting life in god so i will close us in prayer and we'll move into worship when everybody who has a hand up has a hand on their shoulder so look around if there's a hand up would you engage them children and we do what we can to release to release our anxiety our stress our trials to you father we want to rejoice we want to sing in the furnace and the fire but sometimes we just can't we don't know how we read a beautiful picture of what's in store for us but father sometimes it just doesn't stick we need each other we need you we need the expression of your love uh, that is through your son impressed on our hearts Father, for everybody in this room right now that has raised their hands, I ask that you come and you rescue them from their situation, Father, that you put their hearts at peace, that you remind them that they are at peace with you because of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, whatever trial it is, that you will crush it under the power of your son. And Father, may we together as a church, as a church family, rejoice in the glory that is to come. sufferings of this time, Father, do not stand a chance to be compared in the glory that is to be revealed. So, Father, we ask for your hand of peace and comfort in these lives this morning. In your son's name.